Hey guys, uh, welcome back to my next episode of 52 Lock Up, 52 Weeks, 52 Crimes. Um, this is a heavy episode, so before we get started, I need to disclose a full warning about today's episode. This episode discusses rape, torture, I mean to the utmost extreme. This is not for children. I mean, no children should be watching 52 Lock Up in general, but like if they're watching, no, you should not be watching. If you are a person who cannot listen to these types of graphic details, please don't watch this episode. Like as much as I, I like, I would love for people to like the show, please don't watch this if you're not gonna be able to handle the graphic details. They don't wanna upset you or traumatize you because this episode may contain information traumatizing to some um, audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Today we are going to be traveling across the seas to Japan in the late 1980s. Um, this crime, when I had heard about it, I mean, it's a lot to process and unload. Um, it hit me really deeply. And the way how the criminals were, were handled, it, it, it fascinates me a lot. Um, a lot of times when you look at uh, different justice systems, you'll see restorative justice or retributive uh, res uh, retributive system, um, which often has like a sprinkled aspect of the Babylonian Hammurabi Code, um, which is interesting. And for those of you who may not know the Hammurabi Code, because you should from school, uh, that is the famous eye for an eye quote, right? It's a collection of like 282 rules that established uh, standards uh, for commercial interactions, fines, punishment to meet the requirements of justice. So an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, and often you'll hear people say like, but an eye for an eye will make the whole world go blind. But with a case like this, you kind of like, where do you stand on that? Because um, this is this is a hard case. So now back to the 1980s in Japan, um, we're actually gonna be looking into the sweet uh, life of a young lady, sweet teenager. Uh, from what I understand and what I found, Japan was doing very well economically. I mean, unemployment went down to like 4%. Uh, fashion was on the rise and had different styles, especially particularly punk, like the rebellious fashion. Uh, which kind of is what really gave birth to the Harajuku district. So for the 80s, for some people, it was fun, but at the same time, there was also some other things that were going on. Uh, like during this time, uh, the crime rate had increased, uh, particularly in the late 80s, uh, where a lot of young women were being robbed, assaulted, kidnapped. Uh, and then there was also the Yamaichi War, uh, which was actually a Yakuza a gang war that was between two different factions, the Yamaguchi Gumi faction and the Ichiwakai faction. Um, they were also dealing with serial killers around the same time that the US was, like they were just being discovered left and right. So there was a lot going on. Now, with that being said, let's talk about Junko Furuta. Now, uh, Junko was born January 18th, 1971. She had one older brother, she had a younger brother. Uh, her father's name was actually uh, Furuta Akira. Uh, she was like 5'3", you know, her your normal teenage girl. Um, she was going to high school and uh, she was considered to be like very good looking. And if you look at her photos, she is absolutely just breathtakingly beautiful. Um, she wasn't really interested like in a rebellious scene. So she wasn't really going to be hanging out like at Harajuku or doing like punk style. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She didn't do drugs. She worked part time at a plastic molding factory after school in October 1988. Um, so she could save up money for like a graduation trip uh, that she was planning with her friends and stuff. Uh, and eventually she was even gonna take an offer for a job at an electronic retailer shop where she had intended to transfer over to work there until she had graduated. Unfortunately, she was not able to accomplish that. However, she was still a well-accomplished student. Uh, she was ambitious, goal-oriented, well-liked by her peers. Uh, I mean, she was every parent's perfect dream. She had high grades, was never really absent, and that absent is what's really important for later on for when she goes missing. Um, to a certain extent, I guess you would call her like the nerdy girl, but she was the nerdy girl that was loved by everyone, except maybe some people in the rebellious crowd, and some of those people would be considered by Miyano Hiroshi. Um, so Hiroshi was born on April 30th, 1970, from what I had found online. Um, it's very hard to find his birthday. Um, he was 16 years old, but he was very involved in the newer generations of the Yakuza uh, Mafia. So Hiroshi often hung around his friend Minato Nobuharu, Ogura Jo, and Yasushi Watanabe, right? So I found multiple sources saying that uh, Hiroshi actually had a crush on Junko. 
Um, but she wasn't like very interested in like dating and she was just focused on like just doing school. Um, and even though she had turned him down politely, um, turning him down in a sense is what led to these horrible events to Junko's crime. Now, just as a reminder, rejection violence is a concerning factor, especially for females, uh, just because there are societal expectations across the world uh, that women are expected to respond favorably to male attention. And when a woman is not interested and responds unfavorably, for those who are severely misogynistic, they'll kind of scoff at the idea of a woman not doing as they desire. Um, but I did also find on a few sites, not many, that they stated that the boys did not know Junko and Hiroshi did not have a crush on her. Um, it was the crime occurred because of what they were involved with with the Yakuza involving uh, the rape and abduction of a lot of women. So you can take it for either way, but I found more stories saying that Hiroshi had asked her out. Now, either way, this crime is, it, it still happened regardless of what provoked it. Now, on November 25th, 1988, Junko had left her job, you know, her little after school job, riding her bike. Uh, she had rode past some bushes and a young boy named Minato Nobuharu, right? Uh, Hiroshi's friend, popped out and just kicked her off of her bike. So she hits the floor and then he just like runs away, right? Now, another young boy runs up next to her, Hiroshi. He's like, oh, are you okay? Like, let me, let, let me help you up. So he helps her up and he asks Junko like, you know, hey, can I walk you home? Now, um, some sources say that Junko knew Hiroshi from the same school, so given the fact that he was also popular and he just helped her up, she kind of considered the fact like, all right, I, I should be at least in good hands. This, at least that, that boy can't come by and kick me off my bike, right? Um, I can't clarify if that's guaranteed what she thought, but that's what for, uh, from the sources that I had found that I'm imagining putting this, uh, the story together for you. So as they were passing by an abandoned warehouse, uh, Hiroshi's demeanor drastically like just switched on her and he forced Junko into the abandoned warehouse. Now she did not want to go in, but he reminded her he was part of the Yakuza and if she did not comply, he would kill her, which in hindsight would have saved her from, from what was coming up. Now at the warehouse, uh, Junko was raped, then uh, brought to the hotel. While she was at the hotel, uh, Hiroshi decided to call his friends. He's proudly talking about the crime he just committed, how he raped Junko. He's all excited. He's calling his friends to meet up with him. Um, and this, the, the friends that he called was uh, Minato, Yasushi, and Ogura, right? Now, they're a, a tight-knit group that has a history of kidnapping and assaulting young girls. Um, so keep in mind, this is the 1980s, especially 1988. There were no iPhones, you know, nothing like that. So it's not like they were like gonna get caught by text message or something, right? So now around 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, Hiroshi leaves the hotel with Junko and meets up with his friends in a park. The trio agrees on keeping her captive because they're like, well, let her go. She's gonna tell the cops. Which is, which is an interesting thing to read about, especially later on. Um, they end up emptying her bag, they go through her belongings and they discover where Junko's parents' address is and they kind of start to use that against her, right? Now, uh, the four started out claiming, you know, we're gonna take you home. Uh, but because they knew her address, they told her uh, if she tried to escape, uh, they would have the Yakuza members uh, kill her entire family. What ends up happening is the four boys take her to Minato's house, uh, which is uh, in a Ayase district of Adachi, and they gang rape her. So Minato's house became like the regular gang hangout. Like that's where they were going to go. And this is where everything that you could think of happens to Junko. So Junko's parents reports her missing after her employer stated, hey, you know, Junko hasn't been at work, which again, keeping in mind how studious she is, that's not like her. Uh, I mean, she was a studious and obedient young lady. So to her parents, like this is news. Um, they were able to report her disappearance to the police two days after. And at that point, the boys forced Junko to call her parents to assure them she was fine. And I can only imagine the phone call going like, Oh, san oh, san Like, you know, I'm fine. Mom and dad, everything's great. And I'm, I'm sure 
there's no way her parents genuinely believed it, but they couldn't get information from her either, right? So they made Junko tell her parents that the police should stop looking around for her. Um, and her mother stated in court that she remembered hearing Junko sounding very breathless on the phone. And Junko told her not to worry and she'll be back home soon. <sighs> so while this is going on, uh, she's kept in Minato's house basement, by the way. Minato's parents uh, were increasingly scared of their son and uh, Miyami Hiroshi because he was involved with the gang violence and the Yakuza. So at some point, they discover Junko while they're there with their son, and Junko was told to pretend she was one of the boys' girlfriend, I presume Hiroshi. And, but at some point, it became evident that she was being held captive. And because the parents were terrified to report their son, <sighs> their fear to not reporting anything is what led to Jungo's imprisonment lasting 44 days. Here's what happens to Jungo. She was forced to be naked every day, raped every day by her vagina and anus. At some point, the boys invited other men to the house to rape her. It is believed that more than 100 men had raped her because the boys advertised, hey, we got a six-year-old girl here for you. Go at her. It is estimated that she went through 500 rapes. At one point, it is reported that she was raped by 12 different men in one day. It was also reported that the men who raped her also enjoyed urinating on her. In one of my resources that I found, it stated that the rapes were supposed to be done by lower ranking Yakuza members. I have no way of confirming that particularly, but we'll just continue. It's still a lot of rapes anyway. Um, she was forced to masturbate in front of them as a show for, for them and their guests. Uh, she had endured severe beatings like being hit with golf clubs or bamboo sticks, burning her skin, having her head bashed in against the cement floor. <sighs> I wish I could say that this was just, oh, like, that's it. But no, 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 no. At some point, the boys were passed out from drinking and she still found the strength to try to call for the police uh, when she had the opportunity. Now, uh, former detective Higashino Kelechi was in charge of the Adachi police station outside of Tokyo. And he distinctly remembers a very 10 second brief phone call from a woman begging for help. Unfortunately, the phone call was cut because they had uh, stopped her. Um, she was covered in lighter fluid and then taunted with a candle for doing that and when she lost the look of fear in her eyes, apparently, she was then lit on fire. And the way that it was like written down and described to me from the resources that I was reading, it makes me think of Baby and Sucker Punch, like right before they lobotomized her. Um, like there's just no fear. She's just like, you can do it. Uh, at least that's the impression that I'm getting from the reading. Now, this is a couple of weeks, right? 16 days in after that call, the police were approached by a 16-year-old boy, uh, Koichi Ihara, and his older brother. Ihara said that he was bullied into raping and torturing a woman held captive at one of his classmates' basement, particularly Nobuharu. Uh, he named Minato's family um, being complicit in their son's act. He said this. So there were two officers being dispatched to Minato's house, however, they were informed that there was no girl inside. The Minatos even invited the officers inside to do a thorough search, but the officers declined, believing that the invitation alone was sufficient proof that there was nothing to be found. In the reports, however, the officers mentioned that they did a preliminary search, meaning they, they didn't really look. Um, I couldn't find the name of the officers or how they were responded to or treated to uh, for not being thorough enough uh, later on. But I mean, my God, talk about dropping the fucking like ball, the bomb, everything. Um, back to Jungo, and this is where it's going to get even more harsher for what happens. So she had various objects being forced into her vagina, anus from bottles iron bars, scissors, uh, roasting needles, grilled chicken skewers, a hot lit bulb that was rubbed until it exploded inside her. 
uh, lit firecrackers uh, in her anus. Her left nipple was ripped off with pliers. Uh, dumbbells were dropped on her stomach while tied to the floor. She's like this and wham, right on the stomach, right? And now that more than likely would have caused neurogenic bowel, which is actually damage to your nerves in your lower spinal regions. Um, nerve disease can do it, but that's not what happened here. The dumbbells would have uh, would have caused spinal damage to the nerves that help control the lower part of your colon. That's the part of the body that sends solid waste out of the body, right? So after that, she was unable to get herself to the bathroom. Like it would take her an hour crawling to get to the bathroom. 10 days into her torture, her eyes were used to put out their cigarettes. She was not permitted to shower. She went many days without food. It was just enough food to keep her alive, to keep the torture going. Like eating live roaches, drinking her own urine or the semen of the captors who had her. She was forced to take drugs. Uh, she was hung from the ceiling to be used as a punching bag placed into, uh, they, it, it said freezer, but I think they meant outside for several hours because it was during the cold time. Remember, this was November in 88. Um, her eyelids were burned with hot wax uh, or lighters. Uh, her breasts were pierced with sewing needles. Her vagina and clitoris was burnt with cigarettes and lighters. Her fingernails were ripped from their nail beds one at a time. The separation in the body that's supposed to happen between the vagina and the anus was ripped with the scissors so there was there was no longer a separation it was just one whole thing going Junko's nasal cavities were so clogged up with blood that she could not breathe through her nose now remember the dumbbell incident that i just explained and the damage it would cause with the the lower spine well that spinal cord injury would get in the way of the body's normal ability to store and eliminate waste, right? Which frequently causes constipation, bowel accidents, which is why she had no control over what was happening, right? So the live roaches and whatever else they fed her or whatever she was forced to drink would enter her uh, gastrointestinal tract or GI tract and the muscles required to push the food by naturally contracting because it's an involuntary muscle, meaning it moves automatically, her body would have struggled to get anything like into the system um, for survival. And because of the pressure on her stomach, everything would just whoop, come back up, right? And so her internal uh, organs began to refuse or uh, food, water, if she tried to drink anything at all. Um, she would just instantly vomit. Um, when there is excessive vomiting, the body becomes severely dehydrated. And I'm sure even she had to have developed a Mallory Weiss tear syndrome uh, from all of the excessive violent vomiting and coughing. Uh, she would vomit enough uh, that it would soil their carpet, uh, which apparently would piss them off. And then that would give them reason to beat her as punishment for vomiting from, from the abuse. Um, now, you got to acknowledge her resilience, um, to withstand everything and still try to make that phone call when she had that opportunity. Um, she had severe leg burns. Um, she had severely uh, bruised muscles that left her unable to walk after 20 days of her ordeal. That is the halfway point. She couldn't handle anything with her hands anymore because her bones were smashed with weights and her fingernails cracked and missing. <sighs> Since it was winter, she was also forced to sleep on a balcony exposed to cold temperatures, which considering everything that was happening to her body, she should have become hypothermic and just passed away, which would have been a hell of a lot easier for her, right? And that's the heartbreaking part because this torture goes on for 44 days. Her eardrums were damaged. Her brain size was reduced. She begged them, begged them, please kill me. Just kill me. They would not grant her that peace. After all of her resilience, she was finally granted her request after she pissed them off. 
With her body as destroyed as it was, with her brain size reduced, on January 4th, 1989, they challenged her to a game of mahjong and said if she won, they would release her. So fighting for her freedom, she won. She died of the additional injuries of uh, the beating she received with an iron barbell. She was set fire to, uh, to her legs, face, stomach, after covering her in lighter fluid. And after everything she endured, the male ego was offended that she had beaten them at Mahjong. Take a minute to breathe after listening to her story. Now, just as a side note, uh, at some point, because the boys had lost uh, sexual interest in her, because obviously they've destroyed her beyond recognition, it led them to also kidnapping uh, and assaulting uh, other women to make up for her, who was like leaving, uh, heading home from work. Um, unfortunately, this didn't free Junko from her torture, but uh, it did lead them to like look for, for more women. Now, Junko's body was placed into a traveling bag and then into a 55 gallon drum filled with wet cement uh, and dropped into a cement truck in Koto, Tokyo. So the crime of Junko was discovered after Miyano and Ogura uh, were arrested for abducting a 19 year old young lady. Now I'm not sure if this is the same one that they abducted when they had Junko in the basement or if it's a different one, like I, I'm not sure because a lot of women were getting abducted. Um, However, on January 23rd, a 19 year old young woman uh, comes forward to the Adachi station to file a complaint of a gang rape and assault and robbery against Ogura and Miyano. She told the police that she knew them. These were juniors that were from her high school and they had taken her to Arakawa uh, waterfront warehouse. Now, where they had sexually assaulted her, that could have been the same warehouse that they took Junko, I'm not sure. Um, but they threatened to kill her and her family if she dared go to the police. I presume the only reason why they didn't take her into the house was probably because they already had Junko. So now, during the interrogation about that particular case um, that they were investi uh, investigating, um, officers implied that Oguda had told them about Miyano committing a murder. Now, Miyano immediately folds. He starts confessing to torturing and murdering Furuta. The confession was a complete surprise to the police because they were working on a couple of different cases, right? They were working on a case where a woman and her son had went missing a few days before Junko uh, was abducted, um, which was on November 16th when that lady, they were working on the case with the 19 year old head and they filed the complaint. So they just, this was thrown at them out of nowhere. And the police find Junko's remains and the DNA of all four boys was found all over that, that girl's body and the trial began in Tokyo on July 31st, 1989. Much like America, Japan's juvenile justice system feels that, you know, minors do have the right to be kind of, you know, and the Japanese juvenile law is largely geared towards rehabilitation and educating young criminals rather than carrying out strict punishments, right? They're trying to stay as restorative as much as possible, but their names were released uh, by the press. So Hanada, uh, Kaz uh, Kazuyoshi, uh, he was so angered that Junko's name and picture was like published everywhere. And then the four boys who committed this crime were being protected. So Kazuyoshi uh, was the editor in chief of a magazine, um, uh, Shukan uh, Bunshun. So he broke that. He was like, nah, fuck this. I'm telling everyone. He released their names in, in their issue on April 20th, 1989. Um, and I quote, he said, human rights aren't needed for brutes. So Hanada in an interview uh, stated that he was well aware of the fact that he knew he was gonna have legal repercussions for this and it violated juvenile uh, laws. But he also noted that there were no penalty uh, regulations in place to punish those boys. So he stepped in, he was like, I don't care. He just went for it. So uh, Junko's uh, perpetrators were tried as adults in Tokyo's district criminal court. They still received special treatment reserved for minors though, which is interesting when I think of cases like my first episode with Amber Wright and her friends, because that's kind of what they were expecting to receive as juveniles for a cruel crime because they were teenagers. So on July 20th, 1990, a year later, all four boys had pled guilty to body injury, but not to murder. See, 
they had pled guilty to a reduced charge, uh, basically committing bodily injury that resulted in death instead of the original first degree murder charge. Now, while you gasp, uh, keep in mind, it is also rumored that because of their connection to the Yakuza, that is also the reason why they were given a lot of leniency. Um, be between their ages and the Yakuza, there's a lot kind of there, right? So uh, Hiroshi was 18 years old. Um, he had the highest sentence uh, that was from 17 years, which later on did get extended to 20 years. Um, and just so you know, by the way, uh, this is actually the maximum number of years that a court can give right before life imprisonment. Um, Hiroshi Miyano later changed his name to Hiroshi uh, Yokoyama and Joe Ogura was 18 years old at the time. Um, he was sentenced to five to 10 years in juvenile prison. Uh, he later changed his name to Joe Kam uh, Kamisako. So you may see like two different names. Uh, Nobuharu Minato, uh, he changed his name to his surname to Shinji. So he's actually Shinji Minato now. He was sentenced between five to nine years and Yasushi Watanabe was 17 at the time of the crime. He was sentenced to five to seven years, which sounds fucking mind-blowing, right? After you hear everything that happened to her. Um, three of the boys end up serving less than eight years, you know, due to their juvenile ages. Um, again, which is what Amber, right, expected, right? Like, oh, I'm a juvenile, like, it's gonna be okay. Um, the leader, like I said, uh, that was Hiroshi, he was uh, given the extension up to 20 years, and that was actually Judge Yanase who had actually extended it. Um, instead of lowering his sentence, he just, the judge did not care. He was like, nope. Adding on three more years, he was doing the best that he could. Um, now, after Miyano's uh, Hiroshi's um, release, Hiroshi was rearrested later on in 2013 for like fraud and later released again um, due to insufficient evidence. Uh, today, apparently, he is an avid kickboxer and found himself like a new posse. Um, his organized crime ties and his uh, MLM schemes, multi level marketing schemes, apparently have made him very wealthy, which is what I didn't anticipate to, to read about, honestly. Um, but anyway, so Minato was sentenced to the, the four to six years and additional five to nine years upon appealing the sentence. Um, Minato's parents, now, Minato's parents, because this is their house and their brother, were not actually charged um, because they claimed that they did not know that any of this was happening under their roof. This sentence dismayed, obviously, Junko's family, and Furuta's parents actually were able to win a civil case against Minato's parents um, at $400,000. Um, unfortunately, uh, Junko's mother suffered a severe mental breakdown during the trial. Um, Minato ended up moving in back with his mother after he was released, but ended up uh, being arrested again in 2018 for attempted murder and assaulting a 32-year-old man with a rotten knife. There's uh, Ogura, uh, also known as uh, Kamisaku, who was released in 2004 after serving his eight-year sentence. Uh, he was adopted by one of his supporters, but there, was, there wasn't additional information about that, just said by one of his supporters. Um, later that year, he had allegedly renewed his contacts with the underworld, and he ended up being arrested for assaulting a 27-year-old acquaintance, uh, Takatoshi. <laughs> Isono, right? He's upset that it sounded like his girlfriend might be involved with Isono and Kamisaku was not having it. He tracked him down, uh, beat him, shoved him in a trunk, and then drove him to Adachi uh, to his mother's bar in um, Misato, which is actually Junko's hometown, and continued to beat him. During the four-hour beating, uh, Kamisaku allegedly threatened to kill the man by telling him that he had killed before and knew how to get away with it. Um, during his trial, uh, Kamisaku admitted to the assault but he denied that he referred to any previous murder or had threatened Isono. He's like, what? What? I've never said anything like that. What do you mean? Um, uh, Nobuharu Minato or Shinji Minato, uh, later on in life, he apparently married uh, a Romanian. And he moved out to Osaka to start like his own family, uh, Minato and his wife. Uh, he had a baby girl. Uh, and then later on, they relocated to Aizu City. Uh, Minato was actually ended up being arrested on suspicion of attempted murder, 
Um, he allegedly assaulted a 32-year-old uh, male company worker with a metal baton on August 19, 2018. He also allegedly slashed a victim's throat with a knife, and Minato was convicted. He was very sarcastic, though, when he was explaining, like, what knife? I'm just talking about. Mm. I think the police are trying to frame me. Like, literally, he was really trying to, like, blow it all up. So now, Yasushi Watanabe is the only one that there's very little to know about. He's been either very quiet, went super straight, or just fucking left. Like, I literally have no clue what happened to him. Like, there are no records of him, like, returning to prison. I don't know if he died. Like, I couldn't find anything. He just went. Like, that's it. Now, on April 2nd, 1989, uh, one day after the perpetrators were arrested, um junko uh at junko's funeral her future employer actually gave her parents uh the uniform that she would have been wearing that they could use to place into her casket because they didn't have a casket the principal of her high school even provided her uh graduating diploma for the parents to give them something um junko's story inspired like several movies uh and a manga uh, illustrated by yoji kamata um and his like most no noteworthy film that everyone knows about is concrete encased high school girl murder case um pretty sure i said that wrong but it was released in 1995 sorry for laughing it's just like insane um, the movie was actually directed by Matsumura Katsuya and starred uh, Kitagawa uh, Yujin um, and a band Yuzu uh, that was the main culprit, um, which by the way, Yuzu is actually a Japanese citrus fruit, which is very delicious. Um, I also found a beautiful poem uh, posted on allpoetry.com by R.M. Allen dedicated to her. So uh, see the references in the video description. Um, I don't know if I can read their material on my video, so feel free to like look it up. So... Um, but that is, that is the story of Junko Furuta. Like, that's, that's an intense story. Like, I want to give you a commentary, but when you read all the things that this young girl, I, I mean, she's 16 years old, 16, and endured all of that for 44 days. She stayed alive for 44 days. Now, I don't know if they finally went too far that, that day in January because she beat them at Mahjong or if if she just gave up finally and realizing like they're just not going to let me go. She had no way of saving herself. She had no way of helping herself. I mean, not those parents were, were not going to were not going to help. Um, and I, I do think it's kind of insane that the, the parents weren't charged either because it was they said they didn't know what was going on under their rooftop. But there was that boy who went to the police station and told them like, no, they they know what's going on. You know, they're just scared of their son. And then at the same time, you kind of look at their situation and go, like, what would you do in that situation? Your son has some lethal connections uh, to the most, you know, controlling and most powerful uh organized crime uh in the country do you open up your mouth do you do you say anything do you not say anything i don't think i would have been able to honestly to do it i don't think i would have been able to be quiet in that regards like and i think i would also be incredibly heartbroken to see if my son was engaging in those activities especially to do that to another uh, 16 year old girl um, I do admit that I am very fascinated with, um, with their upbringing and I want to know, uh, but this, I hadn't, I wasn't, I was not able to find out much about, uh, any of them in regards to, um, their upbringing, especially Hiroshi, right? Cause he's, he's actually the ringleader and I wanted to know like, what was your life, um, what developed you into this person you had to have seen some really heavy hard shit that created this person to do this to jungo um and then get your friends involved um although i'm not saying that the other the other three weren't like harding criminals themselves and they didn't develop that but what was happening in your life that created this person by the age of like 16 17 years old like whoa what the fuck like what happened um, I kind of 
wish that they would, uh, you know, at least at least one of them would put out a book talking about their childhood. Um, mm-hmm. Just because I, I want to know, like, how did how did you become that person by sixteen? Like, you know, like what was really going on? Um, but uh, I digress. So that is to today's episode uh, in regards to uh, Junko uh, Furuta. Uh, I mean, I, I that is something no parent or anyone in general should have to to deal with, and that that it's such a hard case to read, and it's it's truly heartbreaking. And my heart goes out to to Junko Furuta's uh, family for those who had survived you know, re, uh, living and telling her story. Um, I did cover this video and her, her story because I just felt like I wanted to uh, cover her story because of all the horrific things that she, she went through. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you are enjoying my 52 lock up, 52 weeks, 52 crimes, if you have any feedback, you want to tell me something about what you know about the crime, maybe I missed something, maybe I messed something up, uh, just... Just let me know. Leave it down in the uh, description down below. Leave me some feedback and some comments. Um, tell me crimes that have your heart that's like taking you by, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. And I mean, and Junko. Oh my God. Poor Junko. Um, but she is remembered for how amazing of a young woman that she is. Uh, Thank you guys again for tuning in. And you guys, I will see you next week for, again, 52 lockup, 52 weeks, 52 crimes.